So welcome to week one presentation on uh, Walter Rodney's Decolonial Marxism. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we can begin the presentation now. So we wanted to start with a quick uh, introduction to who Walter Rodney was himself. So Rodney was born on the 23rd of March, 1942, and he lived until the 13th of June, 1980. He was born in Georgetown, Guyana, while it was still under British rule. He attended the University College of the West Indies in 1960, and formative in his youth was a visit that he paid to Cuba and the Soviet Union in the early 1960s. He wrote his dissertation at age 24, which is a very impressive accomplishment, and his dissertation was on a history of the Upper Guinea coast from 1545 to 1800. He taught at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and UWI, Jamaica. And on 15th October 1968, the government of Jamaica declared Rodney persona non grata, caused and this caused protests by students in the poor known as the Rodney riots. In 1974, Rodney returned to Guyana from Tanzania. He founded the Working People's Alliance. On the 13th of June 1980, he was killed in Georgetown at the age of 38 by a bomb in his car in an assassination. In 2014, the Commission of Inquiry concluded in their report that Rodney's death was a state-ordered killing by the government of Guyana, and that was adopted in 2021 by the National Assembly of Guyana, which voted to adopt a resolution to implement these findings. And some of his other important texts that many of you may have heard of uh, are How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, The Russian Revolution, A View from the Third World, and Groundings with My Brothers. So a little bit of background on this text. Uh, it's a previously unpublished collection of Rodney's essays on race, colonialism, and Marxism. The essays are Marx on Section 1, Marxist Theory and Mass Action, A Brief Tribute to Emma Clark Cabral, Masses in Action, Marxism and African Liberation, Marxism as a Third World Ideology, Labor as a Conceptual Framework for Pan-African Studies, The Angolan Question, Development and Underdevelopment in Section 2, Historical Roots of African Underdevelopment, Problems of Third World Development, uh, Slavery and Underdevelopment. Then in Section 3, their Pedagogy and Ours on Education, the British Colonialist School of African Historiography and the Question of African Independence, Education in Colonial Africa, Education in African Contemporary Tanzania. And then in Section 4, Building Socialism, Tanzanian Ujamaa and Scientific Socialism, Class Contradictions in Tanzania, Transition, and finally, Decolonization. So we wanted to begin by discussing the foreword by Ngugi Watiango, who is an influential Kenyan author, poet, activist, and decolonial thinker. In his introduction, Ngugi writes that colonization with all its interlinked economic, political, cultural, and even psychic dimensions has been central to the making of capitalist modernity. It's been part of the negation of the African humanity. Western modernity is rooted in the looting of a continent. And then he writes that one of the most frequently propagated colonial mythologies is that of Europe and the West having developed Africa. The myth continues today with the West seen as donor to Africa. And he states very definitively that it was Walter Rodney who best articulated a refutation of that mythology in his now universally acclaimed classic, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Rodney was able to do this because of his Marxian approaches to history, but he was able to add the racial and colonial dimension to this. Race, gender, and colonialism were integral to the development of capitalism to its current stage of global imperialism. Decolonization at the economic, political, cultural, and psychic levels has to involve both the colonizer and the colonized. Even our methodologies need to be decolonized from the Eurocentric basis. Marx's class analysis needs the dimensions of race and colony and gender to complete it. And finally, he concludes in a very uh, definitive proclamation that with the dimensions of race and colony added to class analysis, Rodney completes Marx. <laughs> then Rodney offers a brief tribute to Emeril Clark Cabral. Just a bit of background on Cabral. He was a Bissau Ghanaian and Cape Verdean revolutionary leader and theorist who was also assassinated in 1973 by agents of the Portuguese government. Uh, Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde were currently at that time in a struggle for independence from Portugal. Rodney wrote of him that Cabral was a theoretician of the highest caliber, but only because he was involved in changing the ugly realities of colonized African society. The accuracy of the interpretation was, in this case, literally a matter of life and death. Paradoxical as it may seem, Cabral, who at the time was involved in a national struggle, was constantly playing down the importance of nationalism by itself, mere nationalism, 
perceiving the difference between a political outlook limited to nationalism and one which encompassed a revolutionary transformation along socialist lines. And Cabral has a quote in which he says, independence is not just a simple matter of expelling the Portuguese, of having a flag and a national anthem. Cabral broke away from a rigid categorization of this or that class as quote, reactionary or revolutionary. Instead, he was concerned with the dual revolutionary or reactionary potential of most of the elements involved in the nationalist struggle. Bitter experience has shown this is not true even for the industrial working class. Cabral was in effect renewing the battle against the concept of revolutionary spontaneity. And that's why he has this invocation against assuming that one class of the peasantry or one of the proletariat itself could be revolutionary in a spontaneous fashion. Walter Rodney concludes on Cabral that not only is he a product and spokesman for that movement, but he has been an active agent in molding the force of change in an anti-imperialist direction. Indeed, one can say that Amalcar Cabral still remains an active agent working against imperialism. We wanted to take a brief moment to note in this section in the brief tribute that Rodney has a discussion of both Cabral and Fanon, where Rodney writes, France Fanon is responsible for popularizing the notion of the revolutionary nature of the African peasantry. But Rodney says that Cabral found it necessary to caution that while the peasantry had the greatest objective interest in the struggle, the peasantry was not a revolutionary force by itself. Rather, it constituted the principal physical force available to the armed struggle. But at the same time, Rodney emphasizes that the contradiction between Cabral and Fanon is more apparent than real. Cabral is warned against, uh, what Cabral is warning against is the facile conclusion drawn by some that the peasants will be spontaneously revolutionary. Cabral was in effect restating the case for painstaking mobilization by the most conscious elements, then and only then would the peasantry be a revolutionary force. And this will take us into chapter three of our discussion. So Marxism and African liberation Rodney presents the overarching question of whether Marxism is relevant for Africa and engages in one of the critical, in a few of the critical debates of the nationalist versus the Marxist, those who claim to espouse a class position as opposed to those who claim to espouse a race position. And I'm not going to read all of these quotes in their entirety, but just to say uh, he addresses the central question, why is it that the question of the relevance of Marxism to society always crops up? In a very brief answer, Rodney says, he would suggest that this is what is common to the application of the question is first, a condition of struggle. And second, people ask the question because of their own bourgeois framework. So a reaction to an imposed bourgeois ideology that they already have. Then next, Rodney argues that there is one common uniting strand to all bourgeois thought. They make common cause in questioning the relevance, the logic and so on of Marxist thought. And Rodney specifically hones in on the Anglo-American tradition which he says is one of intense hostility, philosophically speaking, towards Marxism. So in the English speaking world as a whole, we have a kind of innate tendency to reject Marxism. And he says it's fashionable to glory in one's ignorance to say that we are against Marxism. When pressed about what it, one responds, but why bother to read it? It is obviously absurd. So one knows it is absurd without reading it, and one doesn't read it because one knows it is absurd. And therefore, one glories in one's ignorance of the position. Rodney's answer to this question is very clear. We have to learn Marx first before rejecting it out of hand or declaring that it is irrelevant to the conditions of the third world. Rodney writes, we have to establish a basis of familiarity with the different intellectual traditions. And as we become familiar with them, we can then be in a better position to evaluate Marxism, Marxism's relevance or irrelevance as the case might be. And he says that he'll proceed on the assumption that we are trying to discern in this discussion whether the variants of time and place are relevant. And that's specifically wondering whether uh, we would have to assume Marxism's validity for the place in which it originated in Western Europe, but can we, ex can we expand out of that condition of just being within Western Europe? Um, is it only applicable to Western Europe in the 19th century in that time and place, or does, it, does its extent uh, of its validity extend geographically outside of Europe in the 19th century? Rodney addresses a critical question throughout this text. He's trying to answer the allegation of Eurocentricity within Marxism as an ideology deriving from Europe and from European thinkers. And he furthers this to say, there are two variables of time and place as we discussed, historical circumstances of time and culture as well, the place, social and cultural conditions within a particular place. 
these are kind of the necessary factors for discussing whether Marxism has an inherent Eurocentricity. And he makes two key points on universalizability. He talks about uh, methodology, and methodology and ideology. And he says, I would suggest two basic reasons why I believe that Marxist thought, scientific socialist thought, would exist at different levels at different times in different places and retain its potential as a tool, as a set of conceptions that people should grasp. And now I'm going to hand it off to Chris. And I don't know if you want to start by introducing yourself very quickly, and then you can kind of go into the presentation. Yeah, um, so my name is Christopher Arago, um, a recent graduate of Cornell University. And I will be continuing the second half of this presentation. So as, as uh, Joseph mentioned in the book, Rodney uh, explains that explains that um, there are two points on the universality of applying Marxist thoughts to different societies, and that is in methodology and in ideology. For so, what is the methodology of Marxism? The methodology is uh, dialectical materialism. So, in the Russian in his book on, in, on the Russian Revolution, he wrote that that aspect of Marxism that which lays claim to universal, valid, universal validity, this method, this scientific method of dialectical materialism, like any other scientific method, it produces results on being applied to a given set of data or conditions. So whenever people say, and this is, this is, this is a very, very common accusation against Marxism, that, oh, it's a white man's ideology or it's a European ideology, Rodney is saying that, no, like, you know, if you, if you were to take Marxism on its own as just like a scientific method, the principles can be applied to any other society, whether it's, you know, uh, 18th or 19th century Europe or modern day Africa. And so um, something I found very, 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 very interesting and very, very crucial when in, in this book was when he talked about Cabral, and how Cabral, you know, and Miguel Cabral in analyzing, in trying to apply Marxism to, to Guinea-Bissau could not completely copy and paste Marxist analysis of England to, to Guinea-Bissau. He had to start looking for, he couldn't look for classes, he had to start looking for modes of production. And this is, this is um, something that's very, very crucial in, in showing that Marxism is not something that's exclusive to, uh, to Europe or to Western Europe, it's something that's universal in that if you look at various societies across various time frames, various periods, you find that there are people who do labor and there are people and in, in and there are, there are modes of production, a system of production, and therefore like Marxism is universal in its methodology. Um, so yeah, and then the second uh, the second aspect of Marxism's universality is in its ideology. So on page 43, uh, Rodney writes, my second consideration of the methodology is to look at Marxism as a revolutionary ideology and as a class ideology. In class societies, all ideologies are class ideologies. All ideologies derive from and support some particular class. So for all practical purposes, we have grown up in capitalist society and bourgeois ideology is dominant in society. Um, you know, again, like, as mentioned, we live in a bourgeois society, we live in a capitalist society, and the most valid critique of capitalism exists in Marxism, and therefore Marxism is, you know, the ideology of the working class, the ideology of the peasant class, the popular classes. Uh, he goes on to say, you know, the set of ideas we call scientific socialism arose within capitalist society to speak to the interests of the producers in that society, to speak to the interests of those who are exploited and those who are expropriated, to speak to the interests of the oppressed or the culturally alienated. And we must understand that of the two major sets of ideas before us, idealism and materialism, bourgeois philosophy and Marxist philosophy, that each of the two is representative of a particular class. Bourgeois ideology is a necessity status quo preserving a scientific socialist position is and remains revolutionary because it aims consciously 
it consciously aims at undermining that system of production and the political relations which flow from it. This is what I mean by revolutionary. So um, what I got from this passage was, uh, what I think was very important was when he, when he mentions that, you know, of scientific socialism speaks to the interest of sisters in that society. So, you know, to the ones, yeah, there are people who say, of course, you know, uh, countries in the third world are not dominated by what you call a traditional working class. You know, most, most countries in the, in the global south tend to be dominated by the peasantry. They tend to be largely agrarian, but for the most part, that was that's that was in that's that's not something that dismisses Marxism because if Marxism is the tool or the analysis for in the interest of the producers in in a in a in a, in a agrarian society the producers are the peasantry and so it's still a valid analytical tool that that speaks to the oppressed and the the, the alienated society in, in society and. Uh, Rodney goes on in page 44 and 45 to say that from time to time there are Marxists who have arisen, who have attempted to deny or denude the Marxism of its revolutionary content. That is true. There are Marxists who have become legal or armchair Marxists, who would like to see Marxism as merely another variant of philosophy and who treat it in a very eclectic fashion, as though one is free to draw from Marxism as one draws from Greek thought and its equivalent. Without looking at the class base and without looking at whether an ideology is supportive of the status quo or not, or, or not. Nevertheless, by and large, we can see Marxism and scientific socialism as subversive of and antithetical to the maintenance of the system of production in which, in, in which we live in. Yet again, I would suggest that African people, like other third world people, have, virt have virtually a vested interest in scientific socialism because it offers itself to them as a weapon of theory. It offers itself to them as that tool at the level of ideas which will be utilized for dismantling the capitalist imperialist structure. This is its concern. Um, Africa, uh, it, oh, you, you can leave it, yeah, leave it on, the, on the previous slide. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, I was going to mention that Africa, due to its general position in the world, in the Capitalist world system as a as a periphery, you know, exporting raw materials, importing finished goods, having a lack of an, indu an industrial base. Most African countries do not really have any industrial, it's, it's no industrial production going on. Due to the fact that this is the sub southern position that Africa occupies in the world system, you know, it's still the most potent tool to elevate. The continent out of that position of subservience remains Marxism. You know, in the in the world of core versus periphery, you know, Amer uh, the global north versus global south. You know, Marxism is the ideology, as, as we mentioned, of the oppressed, the alienated, the ex exploited, expropriated, and there is no other population in our current world system that's more exploited, more oppressed than those in the global south, especially those. On the African continent. Um, you, next slide. Yeah, uh, like I mentioned, and I, I, I'm out, I, I, I now, yeah, so um, Rodney keeps, Rodney also goes on this point about, you know, all of us being, all countries being in, in, incorporating one single capitalist system of production. So he says, you know, it seems, yeah. Marxism cannot therefore be termed a European phenomenon, and the onus will certainly be on those who have this phenomenon, which has already universalized itself, is somehow inapplicable to some black people. They seem not to take into account that already method the methodology and ideology and ideology have been utilized, internalized, domesticated in large parts of the world that are not European. That it is already the ideology of 800 million Chinese people. It is already the ideology which guided the Vietnamese people to successfully struggle and to, and to the defeat of imperialism. That is already the ideology which allows North Korea to transform itself from backward quasi feudal, quasi colonial terrain into an independent industrial power. 
that is already the ideology which has been adopted on the Latin American continent, and that serves the basis for development in the Republic of Cuba. That it's the, already the ideology that, that, that was used by Cabral, that was used by Samora Machel, which is in use on the African continent itself to underline and underscore struggle and the construction of a new society. We have all, we have all historically been incorporated within the capitalist system of production, and that is another dimension, the relevance of, of Marxism. Even without the translation in terms of time and place, it seems to me that if we have become part of the capitalist imperialist world, then we owe to ourselves to relate, to follow, to understand, and to hopefully adopt and adapt a critique of the capitalist system, because that's essentially what Marx's writing is about. He was critiquing the capitalist system. If we want to understand the world in which we live in, which is the world dominated by capitalism, then we must understand the center of that system. Again, this, this is for the most part, um, it's more of what I, just, what I just mentioned, which is the core periphery system that we live in. You know, um, for people to say that Marxism is inapplicable to Africans is flat out wrong. You know, Africans don't live in that world. And we, Africa, Africa as a continent is a, is a part and parcel of the capitalist world system, you know, occupying a position of subservience. And there's no other, you know, there's no other ideology, no other system of thinking that criticizes capitalism more than Marxism, or more accurately than Marxism. Uh, the, the next slide. Yeah, well, um, and then um, on Marxist thoughts on applicability. Uh, uh, critics of Marx are right in saying that the particular class configuration or even the absence of classes in a, in a third world country does not conform to the model of analysis that Marx might have organized for Western Europe. So again, I, I mentioned it is true that in most global South countries, the majority of the population is not the working class. It's due, and this is due to the fact that majority of the population works in agriculture, and these countries do not have a, an industrial base. There's no industrial working class. So this image does not conform to the model of uh, industrial England that in, that, or industrial Europe that Marx was writing about. However, uh, Rodney goes on, he overlooked that which Marx himself had said, because Marx didn't claim that he was organizing a philosophical worldview and that he had created categories for Western Europe, which were applicable in and themselves to the third world, applicable without any new intellectual or analytical effort. Indeed, Marx had to ch chastise those individuals, some of them calling themselves Marxists, who would have liked to, uh, to have applied his understanding of Western Europe in a very official way to the development of Eastern Europe. And he had to warn them that Marxism was not a general historical philosophical on the understanding of the world at all time, in all place. Similar points in his Russian Revolution, Rodney quotes Marx himself in an 1877 letter responding to the editor of the Russian publication. Uh, I'm going to skip that because I do not know how to, how to pronounce that. Wrote a critical capital saying that it is absolutely necessary for this critique to metamorph metamorph metamorphose and my historical sketch of the genesis of capitalism in Western Europe into a historical philosophical theory of general development imposed by fate on all peoples, whatever the historical circumstances in which they are placed. Marx also wrote to Vera Zasulich that where he said the historical inevitability of capitalism is therefore expressive, expressly restricted, restricted to, to the countries of Western Europe. So basically this is to say that, you know, the path that Europe took advancing from feudalism to capitalism is not the path that every, every country in the world is going to take. Um, Marx was applying the tools of dialectical materialism and historical materialism to Europe in that particular era. And it is a task of current day Marxists, especially those located in the global south, in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, to apply that method without 
with, without just copy and pasting mass analysis of Europe. So I put that method to, to their own societies. And this is what people like, you know, like Cabral, like Mao, like Lenin, like Samia Amin did. They took the method, the, the methodology of Marxism, and applied it specifically to the, to the histories and the particularities of their society. Uh, next slide. And this is on how to apply Marxism to the third world. Uh, on page 49, Rodney states, any ideology when applied must be applied with sensitivity. It must be applied with thorough grasp of the internal realities of a given society. When the Chinese first picked up the Marxist text, they were European texts. They came loaded with conceptions of the historical development of Europe itself. It was the task of the Chinese to deal with that and to adapt it, and to scrutinize it and see how it was applicable to their society. First and foremost, to be scientific, even having to do, even having due regard for the specifics of Chinese historical and social developments. And back to Cabral, Rodney also says, is of course making sure that Marxism does not simply appear as a summation of other people's history, who appears as the living force within one's history. This is the task of anybody who considers himself or herself a Marxist type, a Marxist. However, because it is fraught with so many difficulties and obstacles, many people take the easy route, which is to stay, take as a finished product rather than as an ongoing social product just to be adapted to their own society. One finds that in looking at Marxist theory as its relevance to race, looking at the relevance of Marxist theory to national emancipation, the petit bourgeois cannot fulfill this historical task for national liberation requires a socialist ideology. We cannot separate the two. And on page 52, Cabral finishes and says, you know, there may be revolutions which may have had a revolutionary theory and which have failed. But there has certainly been no revolution which has been which has succeeded without a revolutionary theory. So what he's basically saying is that you know, um, as Marxists, we have to be very very flexible. We cannot be rigid in our analysis of particular societies. We can't just take you know the schema the schematic of Marx in industrial England and just apply it to countries in the global south. Next slide. Uh, and is there a third way between capitalism and socialism? Rodney's answer is no. He says on page 46, what I will attempt to deal with as best as I can are certain questions arising from individuals who might say yes to most of what I've said and then, and then will ask the question, is there no alternative? Is there no ideological system which is neither capitalist or socialist, or is anti-capitalist, who addresses itself more humanely, if you like, the interest of African people wherever they are? My own formulation we will, be, will be to suggest that we look at concrete examples of African or Black people who have attempted to devise systems which they consider non-capitalist and non-socialist, systems they consider valid alternatives to scientific socialism, for the emancipation of African people. Next, next slide. And the perfect, or uh, yeah, the perfect example of one of these people who have tried to seek a third way between scientific socialism and capitalism is Kwame Nkrumah. Um, so Kwame Nkrumah was the first independent leader of Ghana. He ruled the country from 1957 to 1966. And he thought, you know, he could synthesize the various history, histories of Africa, which consisted of traditional African religion, Islam, and, and, uh, and colonialism, which he called cons conscientism. He said, you know, of course, like, you know, what, 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 what Nkrumah said was, was that, you know, in pre-colonial Africa, there was no classes, and Africa was, the, or at least in Ghana, Ghana was a communal society of no classes, egalitarian, and therefore it was the task of them to, you know, 
revive this society that colonialism had disrupted in order to construct what he called what, what his version of African, social, African socialism. Um, he would ultimately fail and he would see the errors of his ways. But in the book, um, uh, Rodney states on the Krumah on page 46, the, sorry, on page 47, he says, you know, Krumah spent a number of years during the 50s and right up to when he was overthrown, in which he was searching for an ideology that was every, an ideology. There was everything other than a straight understanding of socialism. What were the practical consequences of his attempt to dissociate himself from an international socialist tradition? We saw in Canada that Krumah steadfastly refused to accept that there were classes, that there were class contradictions in Ghana. A most significant test of this position was when Krumah himself was overthrown. After he was overthrown, he wrote a small text titled Class Struggle in Africa. It's there that Krumah himself, in effect, had made the consequences, the consequences of an ideology which espoused an African cause, but which felt an historical necessity to separate itself from scientific socialism. Because Nkrumah denied the existence of classes in Ghana or to the petty bourgeoisie as a class overthrew him. And then he said it was a terrible mistake. Yes, there are classes in Africa. Yes, the petty bourgeoisie is a class with interest fundamentally opposed to workers and peasants in Africa. Yes, the class interest of the petty bourgeoisie is the same, but at least in large, is tied in, in with the class interest of, of international monopoly capital. And therefore, we have in Africa a class struggle within the African continent and a struggle against imperialism. Uh, uh, this argument that, you know, Africans are, I've, I've, you know, I've heard this argument several times that Africans are naturally communal or Africans live in a, live, Africans live in a, in a communal way and that, you know, we don't have to look to socialism or look to Marxism European ideology, or look that we have to be anti capitalist, we have to look at the past and that. And this is, this is, this is all, for the most part, a good sentiment. But however, without recognizing the fact that African society, like any other society under capitalism, is stratified um, amongst various classes, the end goal or the, the end states is what happens in Krumah, you know trying to build a society, a social society, without acknowledging the fact of the reality of class struggle, without waging war against the local bourgeoisie, war against the, against the interests of the working classes, the popular classes, the peasant classes. So um, as, a, as an African, you know, or just as a, as a from the global south, it, it's why it's, it's interesting to see people say these things about, you know, Africans being actually communal, you know, ideologies such as, you know, Ubuntu, Ubuntuism. Okay, these are all very good as rhetoric. When it comes to constructing a social society, it's very, very important to take into consideration things like class, things like class struggle. Uh, yeah, could you move to, move on to the next slide? And in chapter four, Marxism as a third world ideology, uh, Rodney restates some of the previous points that we've been, that he's been going through in the previous chapters. You know, on the question of relevance to the entire third world, of Marxism to the entire third world, he, he states, you know, so in trying to answer the question, how is Marxism relevant to the third world? My insistence is that we understand Africa, Asia, and Latin America which referred to as the third world does not constitute a socio-economic system, which is distinct from the capitalist senses of the world. Colonial opposition, and then he also explains about colonial opposition to Marxism. He says the colonial powers that spokesmen and ideologies simply said, in effect, that Marxism was not good for the natives, that this is not a vision of the world which should be incorporated into the way in which colonial people saw themselves, to the societies and to the world outside. The colonialist created a generation of third world scholars who were immersed in bourgeois theory. They were automatically anti-Marxist, they had an idealist vision of the world, and they assumed that they had, what they had was a universalistic vision. They said the capitalist system, and they thought that the capitalist system always was and always will be. He goes on saying, 
because one can be brought into line with the bourgeois worldview, either by being brought to the metropolitan itself, or alternatively, the bourgeois institutions can be transferred to the metropolitan to do the job locally. Um, this opposition to Marxism, again, this, this was written in the 70s and 80s. This opposition to Marxism is still something that's very constant in countries in the global south. Now, just as countries in, 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 the, in the metropole, in the core, in, in, in the global north are hostile to Marxism, that hostility is also present in the global south. You know, um, students in universities that train to study neoclassical economics, they are funneled into banks, into, uh, into international financial institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank. They are taught, you know, neoclassical orthodoxy. They are taught that neoliberalism is the only, is the one and only way, only what, only road towards development. You know, there is no other alternative. And this opposition to Marxism has its roots in, in colonialism. You know, um, in lots of the colonies, when, when the communist parties were being created, they were immediately banned by a lot of the colonial powers because they understood the dangers of a third world dominated, a third world controlled by communism, a third world that had that that was able to utilize Marxism. And I see again this this and this um critique of you know saying that the natives that Marxism is not a, is not a world view that the natives should see themselves in. Um, interestingly, it's also war, it's also a rhetoric that also not just espoused expel, by you know capitalist imperialist opposition, but also some people on the left, people who are generally well-meaning, but due to the but due to the history of Marxism as you know being created by a European, we tend to see that you know. We should not see ourselves in a European's worldview, but this is obviously wrong. As you know, Marxism has been the most potent tool for liberation in the, in the third world. Uh, and then um, Rodney goes on to mention Marxism double potency in the third world, stating that while colonialists were hostile towards Marxists inside of their own countries, they were doubly hostile to Marxism and to Marxism who appeared in the third world. The bourgeois metropolitan system are certainly has certain capacities to accommodate, but the third world practice for many years, and I think it still remains true, is to, re to relatively oppose on the part of the same powers, development of Marxist thoughts. It seems to me then that the bourgeoisie themselves recognize their vulnerability in the third world. They recognize that Marxist thought is a double potency, if you like, in third world countries. Next slide. So on creating alternatives and the linking. So um, a very, very, one of the quotes that I, like, I really love in this book is on page 15, where it says, you know, in Africa as a whole, people say there's a need for African socialism. It would be, it would be said in India, in Sri Lanka, let us look for something that relates to our own culture. These are powerful arguments because they address real emotion. They address the colonial misconception of himself. The colonial, after all, had been challenged as a being his very identity has had been challenged. He has been he had been exposed to cultural imperialism in addition to political and economic exploitation, and therefore he rings a certain bell and elicits sympathy when one says we must avoid all foreign domination of thoughts and we must ensure that what we create is ours, that we cannot reject capitalism and bourgeois theory and take in its place socialism or Marxist theory. But this is a new form of imposition. I think that this is the argument as they would put forward at best, and I still feel that at the best, it is false. The only choice, oh yeah, so, yeah. so what he's basically saying is that although these people who, you know, you might consider them to be on the left, when really they talk about, you know, um, cultural nationalism, about, about having the colonial express themselves, express their culture in opposition to all form of foreign thought, whether bourgeois theory or Marxist theory, you know, you can see in Africa we have you know, Nkrumah, Kenneth Kaunda, or uh, Leopold Senghor with the idea of negritude, you know, of you know, creating something that's truly African. And in, in, other, in other societies, you know, in, in, in Indian Sri Lanka, people say, you know, let's create something of our own. But 
this is a false, this, this, is, this is a false argument as, you know, these societies, were not, these societies are not separate. They are not a separate form of social, they are not separate from a separate social economic system. Why they might be different culture, the conditions in all global south, why countries might have different cultures, their conditions are all universal. You know, um, the global south for the most part is, is, is actually very, very similar. You know, for the most part, the problems in Nigeria, in Brazil, in South Africa, in India are all very, very similar. And as Marxists, you know, the, the slogan is, you know, workers of the world unite. And, that, and that is recognizing that in all capitalist countries, especially in global south countries, the condition of the popular classes of the masses is universal. They are all exploited by the imperialist system, and therefore it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to resort to this cultural nationalism. Um, he then mentions the idea of the linking, which is um, a very very interesting idea that has been expounded upon by Sami Amin, an Egyptian economist. Um, the idea that you know, of course, that the only route towards development for Lots of countries in the global south is to be linked to remove themselves from the capitalist imperialist system, and this can only be be, be achieved through socialism. It can only be achieved by the popular classes. It cannot be achieved by by the by the upper classes. Uh, next slide. And, and then it's. it's what he mentions of the reasons why Marxism is going in third world. He says Marxism is going in third world, the appears to me to derive from practical experience in the third world. Ever since independence, these countries have, have had certain experiences. They have set out, for instance, to develop themselves. But they utilize the well-known bourgeois theoretical assumptions about how one develops. They, develop, they utilize bourgeois advisors to set up their, their four and five-day development plans. Each life bourgeois international experts to tell them how to take off, and the result is there for everyone to see. It is the failure of bourgeois thoughts to deliver the goods, if you like. It is no longer possible to say that bourgeois theory has any possibilities of growth for the third world countries. What are the ways of this state of dependency and on, on the development? So it is the practice which accounts, in no small measure, for the advance of Marxism in the third world. It goes on page 68 to say that many in third world countries began their political independence with the internal class struggle at a very low level because the internal classes have been stopped or related to external capital and the operation of internal class struggle had been stopped or related to the operation of the national struggle of all classes against the external monopoly capitalists. But as the years advanced in independence, the evidence began to grow of the decisive role of internal class struggles. Of course, to say that Marxism is relevant does not necessarily say that the body of Marxist thought which exists is adequate to an understanding of the third world predicament. So there's a body of Marxist literature which is inadequate to the needs of the third world because it just does not deal for the most part with the problems of the third world. And on the challenges for the third world Marxist, he states, he is not merely transferring known truths from another part of the world to the African or Asian situations. He has to engage in a very difficult task of building from the bottom, an actual body of Marxist inquiry and Marxist analysis of the societies in question. Marxism can only be of value if whatever it takes has to be universal is applied to the particular. And it is in this, in the very particularity of the exercise, that one will demonstrate that the universal actually, the universal is actually universal and that it is applicable. On page 71, it goes on to say, if you do not attempt to develop a respect to these specific situations, or rather merely to transfer a body of knowledge in a fixed static form from another part of the world, then you will be accused of being irrelevant. You'll be accused of cultural hegemony. You'll be accused of trying to force the indigenous, indigenous interpretation into your own external imperialist oriented model. This is why I think that the responsibility which Talbot Marxists carry is an extremely heavy responsibility. In Western Europe, in North America, it's possible to plug into an ex existing body of thought. The third world scholar is more often than not starting from the very beginning, having nothing to review, 
a blatant house, but sometimes inadequate empirical data. Empirical data will just be collated, collated and picked up from the sources. So the third one marks it will find themselves starting from scratch. But it's a task that's, that has to be carried out because to do otherwise is to precisely fall into the hands of those who want to sort of cultural exceptionalism. But it is the task that has to be carried out to do otherwise is precisely to fall into the hands of those who want to sort of cultural exceptionalism. Who say that Marxism is not for us because it's inimical or antithetical to our own culture and our own history. Next slide. Okay, thanks so much, Chris. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for the presentation. So now what we're gonna do, we have these discussion questions.